young people are going through this stuff and if they can find that they are important, that their story is important, that they're worth something, you can do anything after that. Welcome to Inspiring Teachers, a show bringing you classroom tips, motivation, and stories from successful educators. Join Tavis Beam and Danny Hogger as they explore the why of teaching. Welcome to Inspiring Teachers. I'm Danny Hogger alongside Tavis Beam. And we're here with another wonderful Skype interview jumping across the nation. We've really hit a lot of states lately. Yeah, we we have. have Maryland and we just did one in Texas. The sun was literally setting on our faces as we rode off into the sunset. <laughs> and now we're here with CJ and CJ Reynolds has so much good content on YouTube that you are one of our shortlist people when we decided we're going to do this show and motivate teachers and talk about what inspires us. You have such a great story, man. You've overcome so much, but you've used it in such a positive way that we thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, man. I appreciate you asking me. It's it's super fun to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we wanted to know, I mean, we've been following you and watching your videos for a bit, um, and I know why you came into teaching, and I wondered if you just might share just a, a short version of that. They can watch your whole video on it. It's an amazing story, um, but why is it that you teach? What is your why of teaching? So I, I think, you know, I, I didn't even like high school is one of the funny things um, that like when people ask, like my students assume because they teach literature that I read tons in high school and I didn't. I, I got away with reading only one book in high school <laughs> um, called Death Be Not Proud, which is like the most depressing book ever. And I read that and then I got out of high school and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to be a drummer. And then I went from that to being a priest, which my wife ruined that because um, you can't be. I, I say that so harshly <laughs> and I really it's, it shouldn't come off that harshly. So I spent like time in a monastery and then I thought I was going to be a clown. And um, but a clown like uh, I feel like clowns get such a bad rap. But uh, I really just wanted to travel to third world countries. Oh, really? I, I used to be a professional circus clown. So. And Awesome. <laughs> so I lived that life for a little while. And ironically, when I graduated with a bachelor's degree in anthropology, the two things I wanted to do was either join a Zen monastery or become a circus clown. And I chose circus clown. I figured stoicism could wait till I'm older. Brothers, question mark? <laughs> <laughs> and I also didn't like school. Right. <laughs> but, other, but other parts of my story uh, completely attached. Um, so like then after spending time in the monastery and then I we, my wife and I lived in Africa and Zambia for a while. And I did like work in a children's hospital there and saw the power that like blowing bubbles next to a kid who's stuck uh, in a crib with malaria, like the power that that had. Um, I came home and I realized like that I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And someone said, you know, you'd be a really good teacher. And I thought, why? Like, I never liked school in my life. Like, I went to college by this point because that's what everyone else did. And it kind of dawned on me that, like, that was exactly, like, it was the the connection of all those other things that I had done. It was, like, being, being kind to people, loving people where they are, using my sort of silly personality. Um, and by then, I'd had a real love of books. It was, like, all of these things together. And you're kind of on stage every day. Uh, cause I really think that like maybe 90% of teaching is acting. Like when I have to act really mad or <laughs> I have to act really surprised or whatever, it, it's, it was like just all that stuff put together and it was the perfect fit for me. Yeah. yeah dude. I love that so much. I love that you called it a percentage, but then 90 like kicked me in the face. That was funny to me. Cause I, <laughs> I'm definitely, I've got the broadcasting background. So t 12 years in radio and TV. And I'm definitely doing a version of myself and more pumped up than if I just met you. You'd think I was crazy if I was like that all the time. Yeah, makes, I'm like a make fun of myself monster machine, right? But it's so cool. How much is it for you since you didn't like it growing up? How much of that sticks in you all the time? You're like, I'm not going to be that teacher that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. Is that a lot yeah. of it? I think a lot. I never, I've never had a teacher where I feel like. Most of my friends, most of my students, most other YouTubers like that are even doing teaching or, or teachers in general have like that one person that inspired them. And I just never did. I feel like all of my teacher inspiration <laughs> was fictional. It was like Mr. Feeney from Boy Meets World was more yeah. of an inspiration <laughs> to me than any teacher I ever had. But it was I, I, I so it wasn't it, that's not what drove me. It was always all these other components that drove me to teaching. So I think, yeah, I mean, and, and as far as the faking part, I think it's, yeah, you have to be like happy on days when, you know, whether your baby spit up on your tie on the way out the door or you have a flat tire or whatever happened, 
you can't drag that into the classroom with you. Um, and if you do, you have to do it sparingly because kids yeah. will react to that. But it's like, guys, I need a day because I need a root canal. I need you to chill. And then everyone will comply. And then, you know, there but I can't. Seem to be like a balance between being genuine and also at the same time holding that what needs to be held back. If you know what I mean. yeah. yeah, for sure. You're completely right. And uh, like one of your videos that I really liked was about when is it appropriate to raise your voice and elevate to a different level? And you said, because you do it sparingly, because mm -hmm. they know then it means something. You're not right. this guy who's just at 10 all the time. Yeah. Yep. You're, you can tell them when it's time. I love the metaphor that you use. If students are about to run into a burning building, you need to shout and keep them to wake up, cut through yes. the noise. Yeah. And uh, I just thought maybe, could you share with us more about... Um, you know, how do you how do you give yourself in the classroom to make them elevated, to give them your wisdom and experience? What do you draw on? What 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 motivates you to do that? Yeah. So I think one is I realize that if I'm not excited about something, I can't expect anybody else to be excited mm -hmm. about something. And so I need to be at my best as close as I can be every day. And I realize like the the level of of stress that comes along with teaching. With teaching, um, no matter where you teach, right? So I teach in inner city Philadelphia. And so the other day I'm in class and someone got shot and killed right outside of my my classroom window, right? Like during class, someone wow. goes, that was a gunshot. And I thought, was it really? Because it's so loud in the city all the time. You can't, you literally can't tell all the time. So we saw the guy out in the street and it was this big event. But And then I had to go back into teaching Merchant of Venice. It's like, how, like, what kind of, show is this that I'm that I'm on right so and even the next day it's you know coming in and the students are that taps into all the stuff like maybe they knew someone that got shot before maybe they themselves have had some sort of um violent episode in the past and so I need to come in at at the best that I can every single day and what that typically looks like is me learning how to take care of myself with me getting up early so the day's not happening to me Right. Like sort of like Tony Robinson says, it's, it's happening for me. And so or Tony Robinson, Robinson, that's a different guy. <laughs> probably. Um, He's probably good too. Robinson, I got shouted out on the Internet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think not taking it too seriously. I think the folks yeah. that really stress out and leave the profession take it too seriously. Well, my class is madness. Like it was the day after that happened last week. I just have to look at it and kind of laugh like this is in, this is a different level of insanity that like, how am I ever supposed to to get this under control? But then you just do. But I think when you're in a good space, it's much easier to do that. And then, you know, I, I, I kid around a lot. I play around a lot. I blow bubbles in the hallway and I shoot kids with like water pistols and stuff like that. And um, <laughs> so when you go from that do I do have to raise my voice? Nobody ever saw that. No one saw the guy that wanted to be a clown yelling, um, like ever coming. But it has to be calculated every single time. I'd never fly off the handle anymore. I've, I've done it. I've done it in the past. And I realized that I don't trust myself doing that. So it has to be 100% calculated when I do it. Absolutely. I've certainly been there and made my fair share of mistakes at yelling. And then you learn how to use it as a tool. That yeah. moment. And now that I teach wood shop, you know, if I'm going to yell, it's going to be, a, uh, it might save somebody's life or somebody's finger or something like that. Yeah. And uh, exactly. so in the rare instance that you use it, they listen. They listen real close. And it, it's nice to know that you do have their attention in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not, it, you're not just yelling all the time for right. no reason. It's, yeah. it's worth a lot more. How do you bring out the intrinsic value of your students? How do you teach them that they are worth and that they can accomplish? And when some of those students, maybe you tell me if I'm wrong, maybe haven't had a lot of people in their life giving them that empowerment. What can you do to make a student realize their potential? What, what work do you, what do you do? Yeah. So one, I tell them, I tell them that they're great. I tell them that I care for them. I tell kids that um, I love you and I want you to do well. And I realize that that's like, a, that's a sticky thing to be able to do. Cause what you're doing is like being vulnerable with students and folks should enter in where they can. Like, if you don't want to go around telling people you love them, dude, I get it. Like, I'm not telling everybody that, but like, Certain kids, when they need it, it it's really goes a long way uh, because you shouldn't 
expect that they're picking up on that. Like they should know that I care for them. No, like you need people to tell you that they care for you. And then mm. I think the other piece is, you know, most of my guys come from a single parent home where mom's working two jobs or grandma's working two jobs to, to keep, to make ends meet. And they don't have a lot of role models that they can look up to. Right. So most of my guys self admittedly would say that they don't it's, and it's guys, it's all boys school in, in West Philly. So mm. they don't have someone at home that they can, that has done what they want to do. And so I am a really big believer in, if you can see it, you can be it. And so I am often bringing folks into my classroom. So I'll bring everyone from entrepreneurs to musicians, to DJs, to cartoon artists, um, graffiti artists into my classroom with this idea that if my students can see someone, um, maybe, maybe that looks like them. So maybe, so the majority of my students are African-American males. So if they bring someone in that they can literally look at and say, I can see myself in this guy and I could do this or just someone that has a similar backstory. So maybe that looks like um, uh, a young woman who came from a difficult situation in the world. And now she's doing something uh, that goes a long way. I mean, what the greatest place we ever kind of went so far was we met with uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. Do you guys know who this dude is? So he's like YouTube famous and he's like a gazillionaire. He has a call-in show on YouTube. I called up, he invited 10 of my students. And typically when he has people to his office, it's a $10,000 a day situation. I take 10 of the roughest kids I can muster up to New York City and we're in this high rise. And they, it ch literally changed kids' lives. Like kids that were going the wrong way fast, that were not going to have anything positive happen in their lives, literally changed their lives. And so, um, yeah, it's, I think that's, that's one of the ways that I do it. They just need to see it and know that it's there and something to aspire to other than what they are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Same, same. Wow. It's really wonderful that you're bringing that to them, that you're in that energy that you're bringing with you. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. But turn, turn, yeah. It's hard. It's hard. Like when, like when, I'm, I'm, <laughs> so like, so like, Shooting, shooting a DM, a DM on, 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 on Instagram, Instagram is it, like, I'm not trying to hook up, right? I'm, I'm trying to like, <laughs> when I'm coming in and speaking to my students, huh. most people are like, yes, that sounds awesome. Like, let's, <laughs> let's do it. Um, and what a refreshing DM to get from someone instead of like, somebody <laughs> trying to take it to you. So yeah, it works well. Yeah. What helps you stay inspired? I know music is important to you. I know drumming has been a big part of your development. And uh, I'm a guitarist. I do free weekly music on Danny Hogger Music every week. Why is that good? How is that helpful? What does it do for you? I think, any, you know, one of the biggest emails I get is like, how do you keep a work-life balance, right? So from, I get, I don't know, sometimes 20 emails a day, right? From just teachers from around the world that are like, I'm freaking out, I'm burning out. It's been mm -hmm. two weeks, two months, two years, whatever it is. And I think you have to have something outside of school that is cathartic, that helps you out. So um, I exercise, I run, I do hot yoga, uh, which my wife laughs at me all the time because I go to. Um, I play music, but that music is one of those things where your mind can, you can't be thinking about what you're doing um, and effectively play music unless you're using sort of the rage of that moment to, <laughs> to play into into your music. So I just think it's so important that you not put all of your time into teaching because there's no end, there's no finish line in teaching. There's, yeah. there's always more preparation to do. There's always more organization, cleaning, planning, whatever it is. And when you can find something else to do, it you just benefit from it, and so does everybody else. Wow. Yeah, I, I've definitely experienced that as well. It's that achieving that state of flow, I think, is what they, they call it, where you where you lose yourself, you lose time, you lose all sense of identity, really, and you just become that thing that you're doing as being yeah. one of the principal things that human beings as a whole need in their life regularly, whether it's running or playing the guitar or doing hot yoga. Uh, yeah, it's, it's all it's all uh, it's all important that you have something to throw yourself into. Yeah. 100%. Helps keep you refreshed. Uh, just a couple more questions. We're so grateful that you join us uh, today, CJ. So um, let's say it's the end of the year now. You've had some really cool experiences. You've had some challenges. You've had some amazing days at school that you didn't think uh, you'd know how to recover from. You do. When your students leave your room and they say, Mr. Reynolds, thank you. What's something you, you would wish that they had learned 
besides curriculum from you as they head off to their next endeavor? Oh man, I think te- I think really more than teaching content, I think getting kids to believe in themselves and having self-confidence, that's the game. Because if you can leave and you've wor- learned to like fail, but grow from it, you've learned to look at yourself reflectively and you've gotten a sense of like, you can get through stuff. Like you've been through things. A lot of my students don't realize that their lives have been extremely difficult, right? And this isn't just my students. I mean, this is, I've talked to folks who teach at schools where kids are super rich and they their parents aren't around. Mm-hmm. They've essentially raised themselves or they've had a nanny stop in every once in a while. And so young people are going through this stuff. And if they can find that they are important, that their story is important, that they're worth something, you can do anything after that, right? Like, uh, and, I, and I just think that that is the most important thing to, to send young people off with is a sense of like, I'm important and I'm worth whatever I'm going after. Mm-hmm. That's huge. It really is. And and it's funny how the, the content that we're supposed to be there to teach kind of is is uh, set aside for the ultimate goal of, of teaching people how to how to really respect themselves and how to uh, how, how to understand that they are worth it. They're worth it, and there's a they can do anything. Yeah. So here's our last question for you. Then, if if we know that burnout happens, we know that difficulty happens. Say someone's coming to you with one of those twenty emails, and you have a chance to talk to them right now in a moment. Why t- continue to teach? What can you tell someone to help them feel inspired once again? I, so I would say, one, maybe they shouldn't, right? So like, let's let's have that conversation too, okay. because I think there's too many teachers in the classroom that it's like you did your work, your time has come, and you and you don't feel connected to the job anymore. And I think there are, there are a handful of jobs like, look, if the cashier at Home Depot doesn't feel connected to their job anymore. Dude, it's all right. Like you can find another job like that. But when we're shaping young people, and I, and I don't mean this in a sense to be judgmental or say that I'm better than anyone else, mm-hmm. but I just think that you get to a point when sometimes um, you should have the conversation with yourself of like whether or not this is the best fit. Now, if you think it is, I really think it takes some, I, I, I think that just having a bit of, um, I don't, how do I, how would I put this? Like, being able to laugh at the job, to look at it in a new way. I think oftentimes, you know, if you've been teaching, look, I've been in this for, this is my 13th year this year. I could mail it in at this point. I have all the lessons plan of all the worksheets. I have all the projects. I could completely mail it in, but I don't. Every year, the kids are into something new. So for the last six months, I've been playing Fortnite every single night. I'm a 42-year-old man that plays Fortnite every single night, right? I listen, I created an elective a couple of years ago, um, not because I love current hip hop music. I did grow up with hip hop music, but I do it more because I want to teach through the lens of something my students are interested in. Mm -hmm. So, and I just think whenever your class is getting boring, find out what your students are interested in. Is it PUBG or Fortnite or the new J. Cole album or Taylor Swift or Monster Trucks, whatever they're interested in, (laughs) you need to find an interest in it also. And then you teach the same content through that lens. So now you're teaching uh, Shakespeare through hip hop. You're teaching vocabulary through Jersey Shore, right? Whatever it is. And I think that you'll find um, that it's a lot more fun and that you're you're having to grow also. You can't just stay the same. That's super. That's a real wrap yeah. with Reynolds right there. Can you tell <laughs> everyone where they can find you and how they can access more amazing inspiration from your channels, please? Yeah, so if you type in Real Rap with Reynolds, I'm probably the only thing. Maybe Ryan Reynolds. I get a lot of emails that address me <laughs> all the time, which is kind of weird. Um, he's my not-so-handsome cousin. But uh, yeah. they, um, so yeah, and then I'm on Twitter and Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and anywhere else I can think of. MySpace, probably, I don't really know. But. <laughs> well, that's fantastic, yeah. man. Thanks for doing everything you do. The messages you put out there, I think, really pump people up, too. So, I mean, from the West Coast here to you, thanks for doing what you do, and we hope that this will help inspire more teachers along the way. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for what you're doing. It's really yeah. important. Come by and be a guest with us again sometime. And right now, for Tavis Beam and Danny Hogger, we thank you for being someone who supports teaching and supports children and students, and we'll see you on the next edition of Inspiring Teachers.